You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to the last episode of Bo- um, Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and WBCA for 2017. It's not the last episode ever. Don't worry about that. If you guys have been really hooked on this show, then I'm flattered. But also, this is the last show I'm going to be doing for the calendar year of 2017. I'll be back on January 2nd, and I'll definitely dedicate the first few episodes of my show to the best of 2017, but I'm really excited. 2018 should be an awesome year. At least I'm hoping it is. It can't be as bad as 2016. I hope, but then again, you know, things could be worse always, but anyway, I've got five new movies to review for you for the show. One that hasn't come out yet, but I will get to that review in just a moment. First, I'm going to get to my usual segment for the last time this year. What's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend, at least in the United States. And number one should be no surprise to anyone, especially people who were standing in line, particularly those who were wearing costumes in line star wars episode eight the last jedi number one at the box office and man what numbers this movie's pulled in this weekend in the united states alone star wars the last jedi has grossed and i'm not making this up 220 million dollars in one weekend that could be a record but don't quote me on that and that's against a budget of 200 million dollars so for a movie with that big a budget to gross all its money back in the united states in one weekend is virtually unheard of but star wars the last jedi did it and it's good news for the walt disney company for sure so on a budget of 200 million dollars star wars episode 8 has so far grossed as i said 220 million in the states but around the world it has grossed 450.8 million dollars that's incredible So it's a tentative hit here in the States. I would not be surprised if it goes certified by next weekend, but it will definitely go certified by the end of the calendar year. But around the world, it is already certified. It's surprising, but it's not surprising at the same time, if you know what I mean. The number two movie in the United States is Ferdinand, which is also a new movie. Now, get this. Star Wars The Last Jedi has grossed $220 million its first weekend. How much has Ferdinand grossed? $13.4 $13.4 million in its first weekend, $200 million less than The Last Jedi. That's also incredible, but then again, not surprising at the same time. But Ferdinand, on a budget of $111 million, has only grossed $13.4 million here in the States and $19.5 million around the world. It's off to a pretty good start being number two at the box office, but it's not looking good in the grand scheme of things. Coco, on the other hand, in its fourth week in release, is doing really, really well. It's not number one for the first time in its four-week run, but it's another Disney film that's also raking in very impressive numbers for the Walt Disney Company. This week it made a decent $9.9 million. Against a budget of $175 million, Coco has so far made $150.7 $150.7 million here in the States and $450.7 million worldwide. So this is also very surprising. It took Star Wars Episode Eight one week to make as much overseas as Coco made in four weeks. That is quite incredible. But then again, both winners for the Walt Disney Company. But Coco is not a hit yet here in the States, surprisingly. But around the world, it is a certified hit. Wonder is number four at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number three last week, having grossed $5.2 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $20 million, though, Wonder has so far grossed $109.1 million here in the States and $154.4 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Justice League was number two at the box office last week. This week, it took a big slide to number five, having only grossed $4.3 million in the U.S. this weekend. Against a budget of $300 million, Justice League has so far grossed $219.6 million here in the States and in a very impressive $636.1 million worldwide, which... Star Wars The Last Jedi will probably beat soundly by next week. But while it's not a hit yet here in the States, around the world it is a certified hit. Daddy's Home 2 
is number five, six in the box office this past week. Uh, it's number six in the box office this week, having grossed $3.8 million. Totally screwed up that right there. But against a budget of $69 million, Daddy's Home 2 has so far grossed $96.6 million here in the States and $157.6 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. Thor Ragnarok, in its seventh week in release, is also doing very well. It's number seven at the box office this past weekend, having grossed $3.1 million. Against a budget of $180 million, though, Thor Ragnarok has so far grossed $306.5 million here in the States and $842 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, and it may eke its way to being a certified hit eventually in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit already. The Disaster Artist took a very big fall. Last week it was number four, this week it's number eight at the box office, having grossed $2.7 million. But against a budget of $10 million, yes, against a budget of $10 million, the Disaster Artist has so far grossed $13 million here in the States and $15.7 million worldwide. So its worldwide gross isn't picking up the slack, but it is a tentative hit so far here in the States and around the world and is certainly generating some Oscar buzz. Murder on the Orient Express is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number seven last week, having grossed $2.5 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $55 million, Murder on the Orient Express has so far grossed $97.3 million here in the States and $298.2 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, which is pretty impressive, especially given its competition. And around the world, it is a certified hit, meaning that we'll probably see a lot more of Detective Poirot, probably played again by Kenneth Branagh. We'll have to see. And finally, Lady Bird is number 10 at the box office, sliding slightly from number 7, but given its budget, it's doing really well. It only grossed $2.1 million this past weekend, but against a budget of $10 million, Lady Bird has so far grossed $26 million in the United States. I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie, but I can tell you it's a certified hit here in the States, and vicariously, it is a certified hit around the world. And we'll certainly hear a lot more about this come Oscar season. If you're a single man under the age of 35, you'd probably like to know what the ladies are looking for on an online dating site. A guy who had a few drinks and later got pulled over for buzz driving. See, that could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And doesn't a guy who's back living with his parents but calls them my roommates just scream Mr. Right? Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Wait, sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I am I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run a oh, that's right. radio we, show. Right, we have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the crap. Oh, crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f- straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's Our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called Fact up. up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. And it's an hour long. Yeah. Only on BFR. <clears throat> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And Words of, on Film, just as a reminder, is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com and this week, WBCA. You are watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television or some community access TV station that is kind enough to pick us up. And to them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing... The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you, before I trip over my words, is Ferdinand. And Ferdinand is the latest animated movie that is based on a book written by Monroe Leaf of the same name. And... The book, Ferdinand, which is about a pacifistic bull, is actually, has actually been made into 
an animated feature before. Not not a feature, but a short. There was a Walt Disney short that came out in 1938 called Ferdinand the Bull. How Blue Sky Studios got the rights to Ferdinand from the Walt Disney Company, I don't know, but they did. But I do have to say that if I were to have any animated animation company remake this, I would want probably Disney to remake it over... Uh, any other studio, maybe even DreamWorks, because, well, Blue Sky Studios did basically the same thing with Ferdinand that that they did with Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who. Although I will grant you, Horton Hears a Who was a lot duller a movie than Ferdinand, but still, it just packed way too many subplots, way too many topical jokes into this movie than it should. But here's a synopsis about the movie Ferdinand. Ferdinand is a bull with a big heart, and he's voiced in this movie by John Cena, of all people, the WWE superstar. But after Ferdinand is mistaken for a dangerous beast, he is captured and torn from his home. Determined to return to his family, he rallies a misfit team on the ultimate adventure. Now, this movie is directed by Carlos Saldana, and Carlos Saldana is a Brazilian director who I think gives enough... I think credibility to Ferdinand being taking place in Madrid, Spain, which is where the book took place. And the bullfights in this film are a central focus to the the story of Ferdinand as it was the original book. Now, bullfighting might not be as accustomable to... American audiences as it is to European audiences, particularly people in Spain. So I think that the animal rights segment of this movie, Ferdinand, might not rub off so well overseas, and so far it hasn't, considering it's only made about $6 million in theaters worldwide, not just in the United States. But that's not the big problem I have with this movie. The problem I have with this movie was that just about every cartoon character in this film, except for Ferdinand and one other bull, were trying to be the comic relief. They were trying to out-laugh each other or make try to be the class clown. And basically, when every character is the class clown than no character is. And I think that there was just way too much octane and too much adrenaline for this story. A story, by the way, about a bull that doesn't want to fight. He just wants to lay in the grass and sniff flowers. And I wish that the movie had stuck with that and maybe like the 1938 short by the Walt Disney Company, maybe kind of leaned a little bit more towards the pacifism aspect of this and not so much the slapstick comedy because I thought most of the other characters except for Ferdinand were just annoying. I did, however, like John Cena as the voice of Ferdinand. I think that John Cena has been in a number of movies, but he's mainly been a tough guy. Even in comedies like Sisters and both Daddy's Home movies, his comedy has been based on the fact that he is a tough guy, and he's stoic. And he hasn't quite shown as much acting range as Dwayne Johnson. But fortunately, Ferdinand, ironically enough, gives him a lot more acting range. He shows a funny side. He shows a very tender side. And I thought John Cena was certainly an interesting casting choice in this movie, but not a bad casting choice. The other characters I didn't really like so much. I just thought either they were, again, trying to be the comic relief and trying to out-comedy each other, I I guess if you want to make comedy an adjective, or they were just carbon copies from other movies. Most especially, there was a a big bull by the name of um, Valiente, who's voiced by Bobby Cannavale, who I thought was the, the moral center of this movie, but he's also a... A stiff, basically. He's the bull who just, you know, takes everything way too seriously and gets down on Ferdinand for being so sensitive. And I, I get that the, the they need that kind of character there. But again, I, I didn't think there was very much originality brought to the character. And there was also, for a book that's only about 30 pages long and that somebody can read in about 
five minutes if they have a greater than fifth grade reading level. I just thought the the things they added to this movie to make it its length of one hour and 46 minutes. Yeah, 46. I, I think it probably should have been maybe an hour and a half at most. It felt like too much filler. For instance, there were these effeminate German stallions that were next door to these bulls that were training for bullfights. And there was a dance-off between the bulls and the stallions, which I didn't think was especially funny. And overall, I didn't really laugh at many of the characters or many of the lines. I laughed a couple of times, but not so much to recommend this movie. I just thought the animation, while it was good, looked a little bit too fluffy and a little bit too geared towards kids, where I think if they had taken the story a little bit more seriously, I think it automatically would have been appealing to everyone, kids and adults. But unfortunately, Ferdinand is just that. It's a lot of fluff, and it gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, not a bad movie, certainly not the worst film I've seen this year, but it could have been so much better if it had just toned down its octane, and if the side characters including that annoying Billy Go played by Kate McKinnon, who I like, by the way, just would have toned it down. It's important to buckle up your kids. I know. Sometimes car seats can be complicated. I know. And if your child's in the wrong seat and you get into a crash. I know. It could lead to a serious injury. I know. So you're 100% sure you have the right car seat for your child's age and size? I don't know. Don't think you know. No, you know. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Make sure you have the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Yeah. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Darkest Hour. This is the latest biography on Winston Churchill. During the early days of World War II, and so this movie takes place approximately 1940, actually in 1940, in May of 1940, the fate of Western Europe hangs on the newly appointed British Prime Minister Winston Churchill who must decide whether to negotiate with Hitler or fight on against incredible odds. The movie is directed by Joe Wright, who is a British director who has brought us such movies as 2005's Pride and Prejudice, 2007's Atonement, 2012's Anna Karenina, and 2011's Hannah. So I've seen... I actually haven't seen any of those movies. Atonement came out in 2007, and if I was hosting Words on Film back then, 10 years ago, I I definitely would have reviewed Atonement, but Atonement was nominated for Best Picture, and Darkest Hour has so far been nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Performance by an Actor in a Motion Picture Drama, Gary Oldman. And Gary Oldman is an odd choice to play Winston Churchill, basically because if you've seen any other Gary Oldman film from Bram Stoker's Dracula to True Romance to the Dark Knight trilogy, you will know one thing. Gary Oldman looks nothing like Winston Churchill, which is why I found it very odd that he was cast in this movie. But then again, to make a compelling performance, you don't need to be a lookalike. I get that. But I think I... I wouldn't have been surprised if somebody like Anthony Hopkins or Toby Jones or Stephen Fry was cast as Winston Churchill instead. So I believe for this part, Gary Oldman had to apply makeup. I don't think he gained the weight to play Winston Churchill, but once you actually get over the fact that Gary Oldman is playing Winston Churchill, you are otherwise mesmerized by his performance. Because from what I know about Winston Churchill, Gary Oldman gets this performance right in so many ways. And it is, it's, it's mesmerizing to see Gary Oldman as Sir Winston Churchill. There are also some great supporting performances in this movie by the likes of Kirsten Scott, excuse me, Kristen Scott Thomas, who plays 
Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine Churchill. And there are some great scenes where Winston Churchill loses his temper and flies off the handle. And then Kristen Scott Thomas comes in and kind of uh, tones, tones it down for him a little bit and puts things in perspective for him. I thought the scenes between the two of them were brilliant. Also a good supporting performance by Lily James, who plays Winston Churchill's new assistant, Elizabeth Layton. Now, I'm not sure if Elizabeth Layton existed in real life, but it doesn't really matter. Whether it's a real character or a composite character, Lily James is, as always, she's not too sore on the eyes, but she also turns in a very good performance here. There are also some great supporting performances by the likes of Ben Mendelsohn, who plays King George VI, who you might remember was played by Colin Firth in The King's Speech. And even though I had to get over the fact that somebody else besides Colin Firth was playing King George VI, and by the way, Colin Firth, for those of you who don't remember, won an Academy Award, a well-deserved Academy Award, by the way, for playing King George VI in The King's Speech. It would have been nice to have had him here, but Ben Mendelsohn and Gary Oldman worked very well off of each other, especially when... King George VI is king during some very troubled times, and he has to deal with the head of government, being Winston Churchill right now, with whom he's had several disagreements, and he certainly doesn't see eye to eye with him, but it turns out that the two of them make the best of enemies. And Winston Churchill was one of those men who governed very well because he kept his friends close, but he also kept, for lack of a better term, his enemies closer. And I think there were some very fascinating scenes in this movie. It does drag a little bit when Winston Churchill is going back and forth with many government officials, including Viscount Halifax, who's played in this movie by Stephen Delane. And Viscount Halifax, according to this movie, and this might be true in real life, but certainly according to this movie, he is very much in favor of negotiating with Hitler and the Nazi party in a in order to avoid war at all costs, even though the world war has just begun. At this point, England is still considering whether to fight or to negotiate. Now, if you know your history, you know exactly how it goes. But I think the sign of a good historical drama is even if you know how the story ends, you really want to see how the story ends. And I think that there are times in this movie, whether or not they are historically accurate or not, where you're still compelled to see how Winston Churchill will react, how he will deal with the crisis in the greater part of Europe, especially when Germany begins to overtake countries like Belgium and France, thus beginning World War II. But in May of 1940, once you're put into the thick of things, the future of Europe, Western Europe, and the world was at that point gravely uncertain. And the, one of the best scenes in this movie was when Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill takes public transportation for the first time in his life. Before this, he had he had only been ferried around in in private cars. But then he just decides on a whim, right before making his final decision in Parliament about whether to negotiate or whether to fight with Germany, he actually takes the subway there. And the the people he interacts with is just a great scene. And I think if there's... I can't say if Gary Ullman will be nominated or not. My guess is that he will be. Because if there's one thing the, the Academy loves, it loves... Actors who are performing real-life people, actors who are performing real-life people with a central role in World War II, and also actors who make a dramatic transformation in appearance. And I think Gary Oldman hits all three of those things. But regardless of all those things, Gary Oldman probably turns in the best performance of his career as Winston Churchill in this movie. And... Other than a snag in the middle where it's kind of boring to watch his speech and sometimes to watch his negotiations, I was taken aback by this movie and the ending when Winston Churchill makes his la- his speech to Parliament before making his ultimate decision is mesmerizing. So it goes without saying that Darkest Hour gets my rating of a knockout. It is a first-rate World War II biopic. I think it does justice to Winston Churchill, regardless of any controversial artistic liberties. And Gary Oldman 
shot. <laughs> hey everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fresh Greens bringing you the best in fresh live and local music every Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. With your host, Heather Mack. We look at the concert listings and we create a playlist using only the local shows that you want to see. Tune in, turn on, and rock out only on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on WBCA and Boston Free Radio. You're watching the show on Somerville Community Access TV, that's Scat V, or a community access radio station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you in advance. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. But either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Shape of Water. This is a movie that's directed by Guillermo del Toro, who also wrote the screenplay. And he wrote the screenplay along with Vanessa Taylor. And Guillermo del Toro also wrote the story to this movie. Now, this is seen by many as an unofficial remake of The Creature of the Black Lagoon. But having not seen the original Creature of the Black Lagoon, I can't exactly say whether or not... It's based on that. I'm not sure if there was a love story in The Creature of the Black Lagoon. I really don't know. It's been a long time since that movie was made. It's a movie that should probably be on my movie bucket list. But in any event, whether or not you've seen the original Creature of the Black Lagoon or you're experiencing this film like I did without having seen the original, I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. It's certainly a monster film, but it's also an adventure, fantasy, and drama. It takes place in the early 1960s during the height of the Cold War, and the Cold War tensions do play a part in this, but it takes place in a research facility where a mute janitor forms a relationship with an aquatic creature. The mute janitor is a woman whose name is Eliza Esposito, and Esposito, I didn't realize this, is another word for orphan, and I didn't yeah, I, I, I think it means orphan in Spanish. It could be Italian, but I'm just going to go with Spanish. And in this movie, Eliza is played by Sally Hawkins in another great performance this year. And a performance that might earn um, Sally Hawkins an Oscar nomination. I do know that she's been nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Performance by an Actress in a Motion Picture Drama. So... Sally Hawkins plays Eliza, who does not speak a word in this movie, and she lives with a man by the name of Giles, who's played by Richard Jenkins. Now, is Eliza Giles's wife? No. Um, Giles is a closeted homosexual who lives with or who has Eliza live with him out of convenience rather than love. So Eliza works as a janitor alongside Zelda Fuller, who in this movie is played by Octavia Spencer, who talks a lot more than, well, I think she does all the talking for Eliza. But because Eliza is a deaf mute, she's not deaf, but she can't speak and, and communicates by way of sign language, well, there's a, a lot of probably back and back rather than back and forth when the two of them are going about their rounds. But things get interesting when this strange aquatic creature gets moved into this research facility and his well-being, the, the creature's well-being, is supervised by a strange shady man by the name of Richard Strickland, who's played in this movie by Michael Shannon. Now, the researcher on this strange amphibian man, who's played by Doug Jones, by the way, although you wouldn't recognize him, the researcher is Dr. Robert 
Hofstetler, who's played in this movie by Michael Stuhlbarg. And Michael Stuhlbarg is a, a guy you would definitely recognize from such movies as A Serious Man and the upcoming Call Me By Your Name, but he also had a recurring role in Boardwalk Empire. And once you see his face, you definitely know who the guy is. And he turns in an impressive supporting performance as well. And as you find out as the movie progresses, there's more to Dr. Hofstetler's character than just being a research lab supervisor, or rather a a researcher and a doctor. There's a certain twist that I won't give away, but I'll just say that it has to do with Cold War tensions, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But what I loved about this film is that Sally Hawkins can show shows in this movie that she can turn in a compelling performance despite not saying a word. And not many other actors can do that well. The only one I could think of is William H. Macy, who was also a mute, although he actually played a guy whose voice box was surgically removed because of a car accident. But that was in a movie called The Wool Hat, which I think was a TV movie, not a film that was released in the theaters. But still, William H. Macy did a great job in that role, and Sally Hawkins' role is kind of like that in, in this movie, although this is more of a love story, albeit an unusual one. But you would think when you hear about a woman who forms a relationship with a strange aquatic creature that you would think it was this tacky sci-fi movie, but Guillermo del Toro, to his credit, takes this movie, like Pan's Labyrinth, and not only delves into the occult and the strange, but he also finds beauty in the absurd. And there is certainly a lot of beauty to be had here. There are certainly scenes here and there that are quite unrealistic and scientifically impossible. But then again, we're talking about a humanoid aquatic creature who looks like the creature of the Black Lagoon. So a lot of times you can suspend disbelief. And during these unrealistic scenes, they are still shot beautifully, especially one scene where Sally Hawkins turns on the the water in her bathtub and lets it overflow in her bathroom as she and the aquatic creature... <laughs> share a connection. I thought that was somewhat of an absurd scene, but certainly very beautifully shot. And there is one scene at the very end, which is reflected on some of the movie posters that also stayed with me long after I saw the movie. So The Shape of Water is a beautiful love story, certainly intriguing science fiction and fantasy story. And Sally Hawkins certainly anchors this film. But of course, the great special effects and makeup team who make the amphibian man played by Doug Jones what he is certainly should have some credit as well. But The Shape of Water gets my rating of a knockout. I thought it was beautiful. It's certainly Guillermo del Toro's return to form. I wouldn't exactly say that Guillermo del Toro has had a slow period by any stretch of the imagination. He certainly has been very busy with other movies and TV shows, but The Shape of Water is probably the film you could take the most seriously from him since Pan's Labyrinth, and I absolutely loved it. Most of my family, they never graduated high school, so I'm trying to break that barrier. My daughter Brooklyn was also a motivation for me to go back to school. Every day after work, went straight to school, and it paid off. At age 26, Kareem finished his high school diploma. I could not have done it alone. I see the future is really bright for me. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Boston Free Radio has no corporate agenda. We're independent media for the people. Your music, your voice, your station.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is My Friend Dahmer. This is the latest from director Mark Myers, who has directed several independent films before this one, including Approaching Union Square from 2006, Harvest from 2010, and How He Fell in Love from 2015. So he certainly has an impressive array of films, but... None of them I've actually seen until My Friend Dahmer. So My Friend Dahmer is actually based on a graphic novel written by a writer and illustrator by the name of Durf Backdurf. And yeah, that is sort of a pen name. Durf Backdurf's real name is John Backdurf. <laughs> yeah, Durf is Fred spelled backwards, so I initially thought maybe his name is Fred, but nope. His name is John Backdurf, and he wrote the book My Friend Dahmer in 2012, and it's not a fictional imagining of what it would have been like to know Jeffrey Dahmer as he was growing up. Durf Backdurf actually did know Jeffrey Dahmer and considered him a friend at one point in high school. So My Friend Dahmer is the true story, albeit with artistic liberties, about a young Jeffrey Dahmer who struggles to belong in high school. And Jeffrey Dahmer, for those of you who don't know, is one of America's most notorious serial killers. He murdered or was at least convicted of murdering 17 men. And not only did he murder them, he also ate some of them. And I'm not exaggerating at all. He actually did this. How many men he actually murdered is a number that Jeffrey Dahmer probably took to his grave when he was killed in prison in 1994. But in any event, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, when he was starting out, was just this very awkward kid in school who struggled with, well, social anxiety and also his repressed homosexuality. So the movie takes place in the late 70s, I want to say 1977 to 78, and... Jeffrey Dahmer in this movie is played by Ross Lynch. And Ross Lynch is a kid who was actually born in 1995 in Littleton, Colorado. So if you, if you want to talk about uh, having bad luck in the, in the geographic department, yeah, he was, he was three years old when Columbine happened in his town. But... Ross Lynch, despite his growing up in unfortunate circumstances, is best known for having acted in a number of Disney Channel movies and TV shows, including Austin and Alley, where he played the character of Austin Moon, and he also acted in Teen Beach Movie. And I haven't seen either of these because I'm an adult, but for an actor on the Disney Channel to go from playing these G-rated characters to playing one of the most notorious serial killers of all time, that's a big jump. I don't even think Disney Ch former Disney Channel stars like Miley Cyrus would have made a jump like this. And I think any young actor who had taken on such dark a role, as dark a role as this one, would allow the film to just swallow them up. But to Ross Lynch's credit, he does actually a commendable job playing the young Jeffrey Dahmer. And man, the kid in this movie is awkward. And of course, everybody has their awkward moments in high school. Certainly people who were a certain kind of person in high school may have left high school and become better. But if you know anything about Jeffrey Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer did not get better. For all intents and purposes, Jeffrey Dahmer's upbringing was relatively normal, if you will. He grew up in a house where his father and mother were married. They weren't abusive to him, although his father didn't approve of his fascination with animal bones. And initially, when you hear about a lot of serial killers, you'll hear one thing about them torturing animals and liking to uh, taking interest and a love in mutilating their dead corpses. But Jeffrey Dahmer in this movie, or at least as played by Ross Lynch, doesn't murder animals. Maybe I gave one part of it away because there is one very tense moment where he takes a, a stray dog into the woods and has a knife with him. But I, I probably just spoiled what he does there. But either way, it's a very tense moment. But what Jeffrey Dahmer likes to do in this movie is he likes to take roadkill, take it to his back shed, and dissolve the roadkill 
in this acid and then take the bones out and study them. So is it a morbid fascination? Yeah, it is. But you would think that if a kid were to do this in real life and their parents are more supportive of their interest in biology, maybe they wouldn't grow up to be a serial killer. But then again, there isn't one main reason, according to this film, why Jeffrey Dahmer becomes who he ultimately becomes. But certainly his fascination with animal bones and his repressed homosexuality, as well as his main awkwardness overall, probably contributed to him becoming as notorious as he ultimately became. So there are some fascinating parts in this movie. I do wish that the movie was told from the perspective of the character who's based on Durf back Durf, who in this movie is played by Alex Wolf. And Alex Wolf is a very recognizable actor, having appeared in Patriot's Day as Jahar Zarnayev, and also in the movie Paper Towns alongside Cara Delevingne. But I, I just wish that the movie had focused on Alex Wolf's character because the movie is called My Friend Dahmer, not Dahmer in High School. So I think having an outsider's point of view of what Jeffrey Dahmer was like in the eyes of people who knew him or who think they knew him would have been fascinating to see. But that being said, you do get a lot of interesting insight and probably some creative artistic liberty about why Dahmer was so sick in the head and maybe... If things happened differently, if people reacted to him differently, maybe he would have turned out better. I don't know. But My Friend Dahmer is certainly a fascinating movie. Fortunately, you don't see Jeffrey Dahmer kill anyone. That comes much, much later in his life. And, man, if you want to watch the documentaries about him, either on a streaming service or on YouTube, go right ahead. But be prepared. It's disturbing stuff. As for my friend Dahmer, it gets my rating of a very high checkout. I do think that the narrative structure should have been better with the perspective of Durf Back Durf, but Ross Lynch did an amazing job portraying Dahmer. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is I, Tanya, which is now in theaters in New York and L.A., but is going to be playing in additional theaters December 22nd. I don't know if it's going to be playing in theaters nationwide yet, but it certainly will be expanding this coming weekend. But I, Tanya is the movie about competitive figure ice skater Tanya Harding, who rises amongst the ranks at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships. But her future in in the activity is thrown into doubt when her ex-husband intervenes. So the movie is directed by Craig Gillespie, 
And Craig Gillespie is an Australian director who has brought us such movies as Lars and the Real Girl, Million Dollar Arm, and The Finest Hours. And The Finest Hours, I thought, was a pretty underrated film. Uh, w- when it came out last year, I, I really enjoyed it. It didn't make my top ten, but I thought it was very good. But Tanya Harding in this movie is played by Margot Robbie. And I will tell you that when I heard Margot Robbie was being cast as Tanya Harding, I thought to myself one thing. Margot Robbie is too attractive to play Tanya Harding. I'm not saying Tanya Harding's unattractive, but, well, Margot Robbie is really, really beautiful, and Tanya Harding is fair. And I think that there there could have been other actresses who might also be pretty, but certainly not as striking as Margot Robbie is. As a matter of fact, there were scenes where Margot Robbie as Tanya Harding was figure skating, and she's doing these pirouettes and other names that I, I can't remember for figure skating moves. But then when the, when the camera focuses on her face, I look at her eyes and I think, nope, that's not Tanya Harding. <laughs> if it was Tanya Harding, or rather, if Tanya Harding looked like that, if she gave up figure skating, she would make a side career as a model. So, yeah, Margot Robbie, I think, was miscast mainly because she's too beautiful. But I don't mean to sound pigheaded when I say that. It's just when when you see a woman as attractive as Margot Robbie play someone as fair as Tanya Harding, you you get taken out of the movie a little bit. And I, I think the reason that Margot Robbie was cast is partly because she's a good actress, which she most certainly is, but also because studio executives thought to themselves, I'm guessing, at least I'm speculating, we we need somebody prettier to play Tanya Harding, even though that's not a requirement. I, I have to say that I think, I, I can't exactly say who uh, who else would have been better suited to play Tanya Harding without insulting those actresses, but again, I'm not saying there's that Tanya Harding's ugly or unattractive. I'm not saying that at all. But there are certain levels of attractiveness, and Margot Robbie exceeds that of Tanya Harding by a lot. But she does well playing Tanya Harding. And she certainly works well alongside Sebastian Stan, best known for playing the Winter Soldier in the Marvel Comics universe, who in this movie plays Jeff Galuli. And there are also great performances by the likes of Allison Janney, who plays Tanya Harding's very strict mother, Lavona Golden. And even though I took issue with Margot Robbie playing Tanya Harding, and I also thought that there was another actress cast as Nancy Kerrigan, who looks more like Selena Gomez than Nancy Kerrigan. That actress is Caitlin Carver, by the way. I watched this movie and had a lot more respect for Tanya Harding after having seen it. Because, let's face it, Tanya Harding went through a lot of crap especially in 1994. Had it not been for O.J. Simpson, Tanya Harding probably would have been the most notorious newsmaker of 1994. But even in the news media coverage, the excessive news media coverage that came when a an acquaintance of Tanya Harding's bodyguard, Sean Ecker, clubbed Nancy Kerrigan in the leg with a rod... There was so much misconception and so much misinformation that came about in the news media. As a matter of fact, there's a guy in this movie who's only credited as hard copy producer, who's played by Bobby Cannavale, and basically he says that I worked for hard copy during the Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding scandal, and when I worked for hard copy, all the other news outlets looked down on hard copy as fake news. Now every news station has been brought down to our level. Bobby Cannavale's character might actually have a point there. But, yeah, it, it, it just became the very first story where it seemed like speculation was the story of the day rather than the facts. And, unfortunately, because of that, Tanya Harding's career and image were ruined. It also didn't help that Tanya Harding had no or had a very limited formal education, having dropped out of school in the fifth grade to pursue figure skating full-time. But 
Tanya Harding certainly had a contentious relationship with her mother, Lavona Golden. And if you've ever seen Lavona Golden in interviews, you can immediately tell why that relationship was contentious. Then again, Ms. Golden cared enough about her daughter's figure skating career that she worked as a waitress, even overtime, to pay for Tanya Harding's lessons and her figure skates, no less. And Tanya Harding had a really rough deal growing up. I mean, not only her corrosive mother, but also the fact that she grew up poor. And figure skating, particularly women's figure skating, doesn't take kindly to people who start from the bottom, or at least not as much as any other sport besides perhaps maybe ballet. Because figure skating is about not only drive and ambition, but it's also about appearance. And Tanya Harding, unfortunately, lacked in that area. So one thing I would have liked to have seen in terms of the narrative is probably Bobby Cannavale's character being more serving more as a narrative framework, maybe narrating the story himself. Because I would have loved to have seen this from a reporter's perspective. But then again, this movie is about Tanya Harding's life, not, not just about the Nancy Kerrigan scandal. But then again, the Nancy Kerrigan scandal is a big part of this movie. But I think there were missed opportunities in terms of the narrative. I thought the acting by Margot Robbie, Sebastian Stan, and Allison Janney was really good to great. But it gets my rating of a checkout because... I do think it is worth seeing to get Tanya Harding's side of the story and also realize what a raw deal she had before and after the scandal. And in the end, I feel really bad for Tanya Harding. So if Margot Robbie was miscast because of her looks as Tanya Harding, at least she made up for that with a good performance that made me feel for Tanya Harding. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers! with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio, that's one word, dot blogspot dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, which, as I stated earlier, is my last show for 2017. So I'm going to be doing what's coming out next. These are the movies that are coming out either this coming weekend or this week. There are actually two movies that are coming out tomorrow in theaters nationwide. The first one is Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, which I think is more of a spinoff of the Robin Williams film than it is a sequel. But it stars Dwayne Johnson... Kevin Hart, Jack Black, and Karen Gillan. And it's about four teenagers who discover an old video game console and are literally drawn into the game's jungle setting, becoming the adult avatars they chose. And it's interesting because in the original Jumanji, the movie with Robin Williams, as in the Chris Van Allisburg book upon which it's based, Jumanji was a board game, not a video game console. So that's interesting, but I still am willing to see this movie, give it the benefit of the doubt. Even though people have a lot of good memories about seeing Jumanji and it's kind of regarded today as a modern classic, I didn't think it was altogether that great a film when I saw it. I love Robin Williams and I like the other actors in the movie like Bonnie Hunt and David Allen Greer, but I thought the movie was okay, but... Here's to seeing whether or not Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle is worth seeing. And unfortunately, I would normally tell you that I will see this movie and I'll let you know what I think next week. But next week, I won't be doing my show. But I'll let you know what I think eventually. The other movie that's coming out tomorrow is one called The Greatest Showman. And this is inspired by the imagination of P.T. Barnum. 
The Greatest Showman is an original musical that celebrates the birth of show business and tales of, tells of a visionary who rose from nothing to create a spectacle that became a worldwide sensation. The movie stars Hugh Jackman as P.T. Barnum and also co-stars Michelle Williams, Zac Efron, Zendaya, and several other people. Now, The Greatest Showman may seem like a movie that... Boz Luhrmann directed, but it's actually directed by Michael Gracie. I say Boz Luhrmann because Hugh Jackman has worked with Boz Luhrmann before, and Boz Luhrmann is certainly, has certainly carved out a niche for himself when it's come to making musicals based on well-known works of fiction, like William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and The Great Gatsby, for better or for worse. And, of course, The Greatest Showman looks to me a lot like Moulin Rouge, also directed by Baz Luhrmann. But in any event, Michael Gracie is actually, uh, he's he's best known for his visual effects. And he's done visual effects for such movies as Ned Kelly, which came out in 2003 and starred Orlando Bloom and Heath Ledger. And also The Magician from 2005, which starred, well, Scott Ryan and is a movie I actually have not seen. So The Greatest Showman is actually his directorial debut, but he's also set to direct a movie called The Muppet Man. Yeah, Muppet is in Jim Henson's Muppets. That movie is in development, so I don't know when it's coming out. I don't even know what it's about. But The Greatest Showman is a movie I will definitely see over my Christmas break, and I'll let you know what I think about it eventually when I return to do my show on January 2nd, 2018. Another movie that's coming out in theaters on Friday is Pitch Perfect 3. This is a movie I know I will see because I'm actually seeing a sneak preview of it tonight. Pitch Perfect 3 has all the Bellas from the original two movies, Anna Kendrick, Brittany Snow, Haley Steinfeld, Rebel Wilson, and several others, and following their win at the World Championship, right after many of them graduated college, the now-separated Bellas reunite for one last singing competition at an overseas USO tour, but they face a group who uses both instruments and voices. So I'd be interested to see how this movie is. As I said, I'm not... I don't have high expectations for Pitch Perfect 3. I thought 1 and 2 were really good, not to mention catchy as hell. But having this movie be overextended into a third one where the where they're out of college and they're coming together, that seems a little contrived. I do think that if Pitch Perfect 3 had Haley Steinfeld in it as a graduating senior and other newer Bellas, I wouldn't be against that. Maybe having Anna Kendrick and Rebel Wilson in cameos. But then again, I like all these actresses, especially Anna Kendrick. So... I don't have any expectations for this film, but I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think eventually when I return to do my show. So that does it for Words on Film for today and for the rest of the year. So it's a little too soon to tell whether 2017 is a good year for films or not. I know certainly the movie industry has been struggling, especially movies in theaters, especially with video on demand and rising prices of tickets. And it's a little, I only have a few seconds left to really get into that, so I won't. But I will tell you that I've had fun watching movies. I've had fun reviewing movies for you. And I love doing this show. And I hope you enjoy watching and listening to it. But until 2018, this is Dan Burke saying happy holidays and I will see you at the movies. Thank you very much for a great Music 2017. Is a bridge.